The first century, Jewish Christians suffered great persecution that tempted them to abandon their faith. The author of Hebrews wrote this expansive book to teach them why they should consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. 2,000 years later, these words and truths are still relevant for our lives today. Jesus is superior to anything we can think of. It's important to remember the preeminence of Christ and what it means when we face trials. We need to know him. Consider Jesus with us as we study the book of Hebrews. Welcome to the Rock Church. My name's Caleb, I'm one of the pastors here. And like Brent said, we're continuing on in our Hebrews study. We're, tonight we're going to be in Hebrews 10 again. We're going to be looking at verses 11 through 18. And so if you have your Bible, you can get those out and uh, follow along. The verses will be on the screen as well. I've entitled this message, When Sins Have Been Forgiven. We'll talk about uh, that theme quite a bit tonight. We're going to be staying on the same train of thought as uh, Josh took us through last week when, he, when we went through verses 1 through 10 in chapter 10, or yeah, 1 through 10 of chapter 10. Many of the sermons I listened to preparing for this pretty much just lumped those two chunks of verses together, 1 through 18 into one message. So it's a lot of uh, the same themes as last week, but we're going to talk about some uh, other applications for our lives. And last week, Pastor Josh, uh, he unpacked some really deep theological foundational truths. He, uh, he used a lot of really big words, especially in his title, if you remember. And it turns out he, t he showed us a lot of pictures of Oprah Winfrey, which uh, was kind of funny. But uh, I want to encourage you, if you missed that talk, to go listen to it. It was fantastic. And today, I just want to share in light of that message, if you, if you heard it, you'll, uh, hopefully it'll just bless you tonight. And uh, we're going to be starting today where we will be ending, uh, which is always fun. Verse 18 of chapter 10, uh, this really is the author's summary point of verses 1 through 18 in chapter 10. Uh, we're going to be really looking at this point that he's been working towards almost since chapter 8 when he began to uh, talk about Jesus ushering in this new and better covenant, and really it's coming to the conclusion for this section, and then he'll move on to his next points uh, next week that we'll look at in, in the last half of chapter 10. But it is this point, I like how it says it in the NLT, it says, when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. And we can just say amen to that. That's such good truth for us. When sins have been forgiven, there's no more sacrifices needed. For several chapters now, the author of Hebrews has been laying this groundwork, this argument that is uh, presenting Jesus as the forever great high priest of heaven. He has talked about Jesus' ministry as high priest. He has gone into great detail about all the heavy metal things of sacrifices and blood and all that, all that fun stuff. He's gone into great length about blood and shedding of blood and blood bringing forgiveness and how that blood shed through the centuries was ultimately just pointing to Jesus, right? It was a shadow and a copy pointing to the cross. And now he is going to wrap all that up with this awesome sentence in verse 18, this kind of say it again louder for those in the back type of moment, right? Like he's been presenting the same argument over and over. And finally, in verse 18, he says, when sins have been forgiven, there's no need for any more sacrifices. Today, we'll unpack and look at some life-changing realities of this sentence, what it means for us. And then I think we'll be able to look at, uh, instead of spending our time doing sacrifices and what he, the author was talking to the Jews about uh, spending all their time with these sacrifices, they're now freed up to do a new and better work. And we'll talk about that as we go along. But before we jump into verse 11, I wanna pray. I invite you to pray with me, and then we'll study uh, 11 through 18. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for worship. Thanks for our brothers leading us in worship and just getting a chance to sing about uh, your goodness to us, your love for us, Lord. I thank you for communion, that we get to celebrate that together and just what the reminder is, Jesus, that you paid the ultimate sacrifice and how that just lines up uh, with what we're studying in Hebrews. So Lord, we just thank you for uh, your goodness to us. We commit our time to you, ask for you to speak to us, and we pray all that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Hebrews 10, verse 11, it says, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. 
This would have been pretty jarring for the Jewish Christian to hear this last sentence, this last part, which can never take away sins. Can you imagine growing up in this culture that that's all you've ever known and all of a sudden an author is writing to you saying that was never going to do what it said it anyway. It was never going to take away your sins, all those sacrifices. Have you ever had a, a it, would, it would make the, uh, the priesthood like seem like a pretty trivial job, right? Like a, a meaningless job. I can imagine the ironic, uh, ironic priests. Have you ever had a, a meaningless, trivial job? What, uh, one that just seems monotonous and same thing every day with no change over and over. I worked at the DMV for nine years, so I understand that pretty well. Uh, just here's your sticker, here's your sticker, here's your sticker. But anyway, that's, uh, that would have been pretty jarring for the Jewish Christians to hear. The, Bible, the believer's Bible commentary said that the sacrificial system done in the tabernacle and temple was an unending routine that left sins untouched and the conscience unrelieved. Man, Josh talked about that last week, that the sacrifice of Jesus Saving faith in God's grace brings a clear conscience before the Lord. And the author of Hebrews is saying, if you're trusting in these animal sacrifices, you'll never have that. God did not provide the Old uh, Testament sacrificial system to fully and finally address sins, right? We've been talking about that. He did it to point to a greater sacrifice that was to come, the shadow, the copy, all of that was pointing to Jesus and the cross. He knew what was to come, the Father did. And so he gave the sacrificial system in hopes that they would see the greater picture eventually. But uh, humans being stubborn people, right, and proud and just like to uh, fix ourselves, we, we take what is good, what God says is good, and what he intends as good, and we, uh, we slowly, you know, make it about us, right? We slowly turn and about our worth and our ability to save ourselves and our good works and how to make us better rather than it being about obeying God and giving him glory. We take what is right and we distort it into this meaningless, trivial work. And uh, I tried to think of a, an example of, of something in my life or something uh, that I think of when I think of trivial work and it made me think of one of my favorite books and movies growing up. I actually have them here. It's called The Phantom Tollbooth. If you know what it is, you, you, you know it's awesome. Uh, every time before streaming services happened, you know, I had to go to the library and put it on hold so that the next month I could pick it up. And I did that on VHS for like my whole childhood. I love this movie. It's from the 60s. It's really old, but it's awesome. Uh, it's this story about a boy named Milo who's bored uh, and he... All of a sudden, this random toll booth shows up, and he goes through it, and he's all of a sudden is a cartoon. He starts as a real, real boy, and then all of a sudden he's a cartoon. He goes through this magical world learning why life is not boring, and knowledge is good, and how you can use your time well. It's all these just, uh, they're songs. I probably, that's why I love musicals. It was probably this movie to start. But uh, if you know it, it's pretty awesome. In it, though, you don't need to know all the details I could talk about. I could do a sermon just on this book, but... Uh, <laughs> I won't. But in the Phantom Tollbooth, there's this bad guy towards the end. He's on the left there. His name is the Terrible Trivium. And he wants to distract the main characters from this journey that they're on, this important uh, journey that they're on. And they come across him, and all of a sudden, he starts giving them this trivial work. He, he tells Milo to, uh, he gives him a pair of tweezers, and there's this pile of sand, and he says, move this pile of sand from here to here. One piece of sand at a time. And then he tells the dog, the, the watchdog, you get it? He's the watchdog, uh, to drain this well with this tiny little syringe. And he tells the humbug to drill a cave through the mountain with a needle. And they just start doing it until they come to their senses and realize that it's just meaningless, uh, pointless work. And I, I just thought of this, though, in context of Hebrews and the sacrificial system, that God gave Israel this important task, but then, unfortunately, the devil and our sin and flesh got in the way and became this terrible trivium that eventually it turned into not honoring God, not pointing, not seeing the big picture that points to Jesus and his ultimate sacrifice. It became about them and their work, and they're, they're going to do greater work, and they're going to do more uh, awesome work, and they're going to do more sacrifices, and they're going to feel good about themselves, right? 
It's this terrible trivium. And instead, you know, the job, uh, God never intended for it to be pointless, right? It had a purpose. It was to point to Jesus. But again, we as sinners, we take what God says is good and we turn it into the wrong thing. And it became about rule keeping. And it came about thinking of ways that we could atone for our own sin. And we do that now in, in different ways than animal sacrifices, but we do that in our own lives. It's almost like uh, this idea of a, a house fire. If your house was on fire and this massive uh, destruction, wreaking havoc, bringing death, pretend that house is your life. Sin is just wreaking havoc all over the place. And we think to ourselves, you know, I've got this. I've got this little squirt gun. I'm going to put the, the fire out, right? It, there's no point. It would never put out the fire, just like these sacrifices were never going to take away sins. You know, and then we can think to ourselves, or we can work our, ourselves up. We can think, I'm going to save more. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to get the Super Soaker XP100, right? That will do the job, right? It worked at my summer parties. It's got to work on this house. But again, no, it's never going to put the fire out. We need to look to the one that can help us with our sin, with the death and the destruction that our sin brings. And that's what religion is, right, though. It's just trying to buy the bigger squirt gun. That's what Israel thought, right? I'll put my nose to the ground. I'll I'll work harder. I'll do these better sacrifices, and I'll trust in what I can do. But God knew that these sacrifices would never remove sin. He knew he would ultimately need to send his son to put out this house fire, right? Jesus brings the the fire hose that can put out the fire in our life. He extinguished the horrors of that fire by sacrificing himself with his own life and his own blood. But until that time, God had asked Israel to participate for for the sake of their own hearts and their own affections and their own obedience and their own uh, uh, allegiance to the Father to follow and obey him in this way. But again, they distorted it. They wouldn't submit obediently to God. They trusted in their own strength and their own self-righteousness. So we need to understand, Christian, the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus means that we can lay down the water gun, right? We can stop trusting in ourselves. We can trust in the Lord to put out that fire. The work is over, and that's the message that the author of Hebrews is trying to get across. When sins have been forgiven, the sacrifices can end. We'll see that continue in verse uh, 12 and 13. It says, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. The sacrifice of Jesus was so powerful and effective that Jesus sat down, right? We talked about this a few weeks ago in chapter 8, Comparing that to the priests who working in the tabernacle and the temple could never sit down because the work was never done, right? It's like owning a house, the, the jobs are never done. Like one thing breaks and then another thing breaks and you it just repeatedly fixing something. Welcome to homeownership, right? It's so fun. But the but Jesus, right, his work could never be repeated. Even if an earthly priest wanted to try and repeat that sacrifice. He never could. It was unrepeatable. And so Jesus sat down. John MacArthur said it this way. I appreciate it. He said, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is so unique that it could never be repeated anyway. So he sat down. It accomplished everything it was ever intended to accomplish. There wasn't anything else to do, nor was there anyone who could reproduce it. It doesn't need to be reproduced, and it cannot be reproduced. So Jesus now is sitting on his throne, waiting for his enemies to be made a footstool under his feet. He is over all things. Jesus is just waiting for the word from his father to say, go back, return, and return for, your, for the earth's final judgment and bring all things under your authority. But the work of atonement by, the, by his sacrifice was completed once for all on the cross. And really here in these uh, first three verses and the rest of the verses we'll look at tonight, the author is really making this contrast. He's continuing that contrast between what did the work of Aaron do, the work of those priests, and what did the work of Jesus do? He's making the point that Jesus is better, his work is better, his priesthood is better. And and we'll continue that argument through the rest of the verses tonight. But I thought it'd be good to just lay out these ideas that the verses we're looking at talk about. 
the priesthood of Aaron, he had to stand daily. But Jesus' priesthood was complete, so he sat down. His work was complete, so he sat down. Aaron's priesthood could never end. It was never ending. But Jesus, his sacrifice was done, and he is waiting for his final victory. Aaron's priesthood, it's the same sacrifice daily, repeatedly. Jesus was once for all. Aaron's priesthood could never remove sin while Jesus' sacrifice purifies his people forever. Aaron's priesthood reminds, only ever reminds of sin and guilt. But Jesus justifies and sanctifies his people. Aaron's priesthood, the sacrifices, it was just an external gesture while Jesus' priesthood was an internal regeneration, a changing of our hearts. Aaron's priesthood was daily admonition of sin and Jesus' sacrifice brought eternal atonement. So good. The contrasting, what man could do and what Jesus did. I think of all these arguments round and round, repeated over and over by the author of Hebrews. Maybe you're like, yeah, we've heard this message the last few weeks. But I think they're really summed up perfectly. They could be boiled down into verse 14 from chapter 10. It says, For by a single offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The author brings us again to why all this really matters. Why do you keep telling us the same thing over and over? I'm sure the readers were asking. What do these Jewish Christians need to understand? What do you and I need to get? What's the reason to know all these deep theological truths about sacrifices and everything? It is this, our first main point. Christ has justified us and the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us. In the NLT of verse 14, it says, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. So the author of Hebrews, once again, is basically bringing this idea to his readers that if you're considering going back to your works-based religion, going back to Judaism, going back to the sacrifices, you're going to trust in your own work for your salvation, then forget it. There's no point because Jesus has already made you perfect. He has already justified you he has justified all those who have put his, their trust in him. And those who are being justified are now being sanctified, or who have been justified are now being sanctified. The author is reminding them of who they are in Jesus. That's so important for us to get. It's the same argument that Paul made to the Corinthians. Some people who read Hebrews think Paul wrote it because he's really unpacking the same argument to the church in Corinth as he is here to the readers in Hebrews, but he said this, do you not know that the unrighteous will never inherit the kingdom of God? And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. So both Paul and the unverified author of Hebrews say this, and Christian, we need to hear this. You are no longer an unrighteous sinner who needs to pay for your sins with sacrifices. Jesus already paid it all. You are washed. You're sanctified. You are justified. You have been perfected. And I, I know some of you are probably thinking like, I'm not perfect. Like, join the club, <laughs> right? I'm not perfect. I'm far from it. Why, why is it saying I'm perfect? Christian, we need to understand this. By the blood of Jesus, you and I have been made holy. That's what sanctified means in its most basic way. We have been made holy. And what does holy mean? We've, it just means in its most basic form that you've been set apart from the world. You've been set apart from your sin. You've been set apart from death and from judgment. You have been set apart for God. You have been set apart from the old covenant way of doing things. And you will continue to be set apart as you grow in holiness, as you continue to be sanctified. So we have been made holy forever, and we're also being made holy, right? So you're, you are holy, and you're being made holy. Makes sense, right? <laughs> That's a little confusing. But it's the true. It's, this is what has happened, and this is what is happening. I appreciated this uh, slide from Josh's talk last week, kind of differentiating it, though, the justification that we have been declared righteous by the sacrifice of Jesus, by trusting in his grace, we have been perfected, we have been justified. And we are also being sanctified, Christian. We will continue to be sanctified through this whole life as we become more like Christ. 
until one day we are glorified. So you have been justified. You are being sanctified. And one day we will be glorified in heaven with Jesus when we are in his presence. To dive further into this, I I really liked the book uh, Systematic Theology had this chart and uh, these four points. I just wanted to point them out to you. I thought they were helpful. Um, Sanctification, number one, has a definite beginning at regeneration. So we are slaves to sin before we know Jesus and we're just sinning all over the place. And then all of a sudden we cross that line there and we we are converted, we become born again, we become justified. And then we're on this trajectory for the rest of our life, this Christian life, where some days we're doing great, and maybe it's this big leap of sanctification, and then other days it's a plateau, right? And we're going along this line, and sanctification increases throughout life, and then ultimately we come to number three. Sanctification is completed at death, and again, we cross that next line. We die, we go to heaven, we go to be with Jesus, and it is complete. We have perfect holiness in the presence of God. And that is the process of sanctification. So why does this matter to us, though? We have to understand it's a process. We have to understand that it's different for all of us. For some of you, salvation was this incredible transformation, like overnight, just chains broken, sinful habits, addictions just taken away. And praise the Lord for that. And then we know others who it's a process, and it's not that where maybe it's a lifelong process of struggling with sin and temptation and addiction until one day they go to be with Jesus. It's a process. Philippians said this about the the process and these small steps like this chart. It says, to work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Not, Not working to earn our salvation, but that you have been saved and now to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It says in verse 13, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. For me, I would say I got saved at a young age. I grew up in a Christian home, and uh, you know there was a lot of growth and a lot of sanctification still needs to be, clearly. Uh, (laughs) And there have been seasons of growth in my life and just really things that God has just come and work and his power and his grace and his spirit has come and got a hold of my heart in certain ways. And then others, there's been seasons of stagnant growth or no growth at all. And uh, the truth is though, when we look back, the process, that chart going further and further up to be more like Jesus, to become more Christ-like, we can look back on our life. I can look back on my life and this idea of sanctification and I can say, I'm not who I was, right? Can you say that about yourself, about your life, that you can see God's hand in your life and you can say, I'm not who I was. I'm not who I want to be. I'm not like Jesus. I sin all over the place. I, I sin all the time. But by God's grace, I'm not who I was. That is the process of sanctification. He changes us from the inside. He changes our desires and our affections as we seek to grow with him, to be more like him by his grace, for his glory, for our joy, right? Tony Evans said this, and he summed it up, I thought, nicely. It says, if you don't keep growing with Jesus, there's nowhere else to go. There's a lot of garbage places in our world to turn to for personal growth, right? A lot of garbage, a lot of self-help. Christian, let's look to Jesus for true change. Let's do that. As we grow with Jesus, he makes us more aware of our sin, and our need for him. And hopefully, if we are listening, if, we are, or if we're leaning in, if we're obeying, we increase in our desire to obey him. So that's the sanctification process. You have been perfected. You have been justified. And Jesus is making you perfect as we walk along this life until one day we be with him and we will be perfect with him. So good. Let's continue on. The author is now going to quote from Jeremiah 31 again. Uh, the prophesied new covenant. Again, we saw this in chapter eight. And he says this, the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for he, after saying, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Quickly, I, I, I wanna point out how these verses are a great picture of the Trinity, the Godhead, one God and three persons. These verses, so good. We are justified by the blood and sacrifice of Jesus, the Son. 
God the Father forgives us of all of our sins and he gives us the righteousness of his son and then he, write, and then he gives us the Holy Spirit to help do the sanctifying work in our hearts and in our lives and the Holy Spirit writes his law on our hearts. In the Old Testament, God wrote on stone tablets given to Moses, right? At the Mount, Mount Sinai, uh, God wrote the Ten Commandments on those tablets. But now, we are the tablets, Christian. If you know Jesus, that is the truth. You are the tablet. First Corinthians says, we are the temple of living God, of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them, and I will walk among them. And then 2 Corinthians says that we are a letter from Christ, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. That's so good. God creates us, uh, creates in us by the Holy Spirit the desire to honor him, to obey him, and he gives us the grace and the means to do that, to become more like Christ. And then we come to one of the greatest promises in the entire Bible, in verse 17 of Hebrews 10. Again, quoting Jeremiah 31, he says this. He adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. We can just go home after that. <laughs> that's so good. That's so good. You can say amen, you know? That's, that's all right. I'm sorry if I'm putting you to sleep. Uh, we can say amen. We can get rowdy about that. God says, I will remember their sins no more. You need to hear that. We need to hear that, right? Our holy, perfect, set-apart God of the universe who can't stand to even look at sin says, I love you so much. I want a relationship with you so much. I want you to know me. I want to know you. I will choose to not remember your sin. That is so good. That's our next point. God has chosen to not remember your sin. God remembers our sin no more, church. <laughs> That's something we all need to hear over and over. And some of you need to hear that more than others, right? Some of us do. We just, we, are, we miss it. You need to hear it for yourself, though. Maybe some here who have trusted in Jesus, who would say they are a Christian, who, have set, who would say they are forgiven, you walk around with, with shame and guilt on you, like, God remembers my sin. You remember it, so God must remember it. This says right here, God does not remember. I will never again remember their sins. If he doesn't remember it, why should we? When you wake or I wake in the middle of the night, right, and we have this feeling of guilt and shame and the devil's just lying to us and saying, you're not forgiven. We can, we can throw this verse in his face and say, God does not remember my sin. He chooses not to. We need to believe that, Christian. Isaiah says this, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. For God's own sake, he does that. And I will not remember your sins. 2 Corinthians 5, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That's so good. We, can, we should just read those over and over every day. If you feel guilt, if you feel shame, and you've trusted in Jesus' work on the cross, you need to read those verses. Does it mean God forgets anything? No, not really. It doesn't mean that. He doesn't forget. But he chooses not to hold our sin against us. When he looks at us, Christian, when he looks at you, he chooses to see the perfect, righteous, his son, Jesus, and because of that, we have a right standing with God because when he sees us, he sees Jesus. He doesn't hold our sin against us. I like how John Piper put it. He said, God does not re uh, God's not remembering means God will never call our sins to mind as a ground for our condemnation. He will not call them to mind in any way that is destructive for us. It's so good. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God chooses to remember our sin no more. He makes that choice. Forgiveness is a choice, and God chooses that daily, and he has chosen that. Again, though, some of you need to hear that for your own life. Maybe some of you are still holding on to the sin that others have done against you. You're unwilling to forgive. Maybe you flat out are like, there's no way I could ever forgive that person. And I, I don't mean to sound insensitive if that's, 
I understand if things are, are hard. But there could be some part of you that isn't believing that God forgives you if you're unwilling to forgive somebody else. And for others, maybe you say, yeah, I, I forgive them, right? Like I, I said I forgive them, but deep down you're still holding on to, on to bitterness, on to pain. It's like saying you forgive them, but then you hold it over them, right? And you know, I'm, I'm not sure that's what God, is, uh, God said is best for us. I don't think that is the case. Listen to this verse in Ephesians. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. It can be so easy, right, to make excuses for some of the big hurts in our life. I get it. I get it. Maybe it's people that you don't interact with anymore. They're not in your life. So it's easy to just hold on to that bitterness. But also, I know there's some people in this room that do that with the family that they see every single day. With, maybe with your spouse. Maybe with your kids. Sadly, that's the case too many times in our world and even in the church. So I wanted to introduce to you somebody uh, in my life, the person that I've sinned against most on this planet and who has sinned against me the most, um, this is my wife, and I'm just being real, real with you guys. These are all pictures of us fighting, uh, and three of those are in ministry, like in the midst of ministry. Uh, when we were dating, we were on a mission trip. They're supposed to be doing outreach on the street in Italy, and we're just fighting about things. And uh, Here's this picture, somebody's like, cheese, and we turn around mid-fight at the top. That's us in the right uh, at an outreach concert. Uh, we're like about to go on, st we're on stage. We're about to like play music, and there's us just fighting. And uh, there's us taking a family photo, like, hey, time out from the photo. We gotta, we gotta argue about this. <laughs> uh, we're, we're stubborn. I am the most difficult person to, to be around, so I feel bad for my wife. Uh, so much of the time. But through all of our arguing, our, proud, our pride, our stubbornness, one of the greatest things that we were taught early on in our relationship was to forgive and to not remember each other's sin. If you forgive it, forget it. We were taught that, and we've tried to live that out, to be quick to forgive when we have an argument and by God's grace, they're less and less nowadays. But even this week, you know, like we're at my kid's baseball game and my kid brought me something for my wife and I just foot and mouth. I'm like, I don't need this right now in front of everybody. And I had to apologize, you know. But my wife is so gracious and so kind to just say, yeah, I forgive you. And then the next time, if the same thing, even when I do the same thing over and over, she doesn't, you do this all the time. I've never heard that. Never heard it. She's so gracious. She's so forgiving. It's just, okay, I forgive you. Let's move on. We need to learn to forgive like God. He chooses not to remember our sin. It's honestly saved my marriage. It's saved so many relationships that I have because, again, I'm unbearably hard to be around. Uh, when somebody forgives me and forgets it, it's just, oh, it's like the Holy Spirit just saying, that's how I forgive you. It's awesome. So I want to encourage you, if you're holding on to hurt, unforgiveness, if you're unable to forget someone's sin against you, you still hold it against them. I want to encourage you to reread these verses in Hebrews 10. I want to encourage you to pray and ask Jesus to help you in your heart to forgive them, to, to release them of that bitterness and that, that uh, thing that you're holding over them. So as we turn our attention to the final verse of the night in verse 18 that we've already read, but we're going to read it again, we see the author's point in all of these arguments. We see the point of where he's headed now in Hebrews before the author of this letter turns his attention to instruction and to help these Jewish Christians who were up against persecution, they were willing and thinking about turning away from uh, their faith in Jesus, before he can get to that, to the practicals of that situation, this entire time, all these 10 chapters, he's been needing to tell these Christians who they are, who they are in Jesus, what Jesus has done for them, the new life that they have what Jesus has made them to be. And this is so important for us because us as humans, we act out of what we believe, right? We behave on what we believe. If the Jewish Christians didn't believe that they were truly justified and perfected and they were being sanctified, if they didn't believe that was their identity and who they are, 
they would think, yeah, I gotta go back and offer some more sacrifices. But if they know it's already done, they will say, no, Jesus paid it all, right? He did it all. They will live in light of that reality. They will have the faith and the courage to stand up to their family, to their neighbor, to their coworker who says, you have it wrong. And they will say, no, I know what Jesus has done for me. They will walk in the truth and reality of that. They can walk in the truth and the reality that when their sins are forgiven, there is no longer a need for, for sacrifice. This is for us too, Christian. Even when we sin, when we mess up, when we fail, even if it's in front of the, Jew, uh, the, the religious people around us, and they would say, whoops, you messed up. You gotta go do all these works. You gotta go get right with God. We can say, no, Jesus paid for that. He already took care of it. Or maybe when they're ridiculed by some unbelieving person that's like, ooh, I thought you were a Christian. How could you have said that? How could you have blown up uh, on your kid? How could you have gotten angry at your spouse? How could you have done that? How could you have lied? You can say, you're right, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, but Jesus forgives me. Thank you, Jesus, that you forgive me. And we can be that living example to the watching world. In fact, we can believe that there is a better work for us even now because we're, we're freed up. We don't have to offer sacrifices. We don't have to do the good works for our salvation. And that's our third point. There's a better work for us now. In all these arguments about priests and sacrifice, Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice. And he calls us now to be priests on his behalf. We have a better work, Christian. He says that in 1 Peter you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So rather than continuing to waste our time with sacrifices, with works, with things that will not give us salvation, we have been freed up for God's kingdom ministry. If we go back to 2 Corinthians, a verse we already looked at in the middle there, but around it, it's just so clear. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has passed away. The new has come. All of this from God who, though, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not, tr not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Get this. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Don't you think it would have been strange for these Jewish Christians, right, who, uh, li again, lived this whole life in this sacrificial system. Their whole calendar was wrapped around the Day of Atonement. It's like, what do I do with all this free time? <laughs> Maybe you feel that way. Like, I've, I've spent so much time striving to gain, gain my own salvation, to get right with God, and now all of a sudden you're freed up. You're like, what do I do now? Maybe you grew up in a religious system where you had to keep working. What are we supposed to do with this time? I thought of uh, when my kids were born. I thought of the struggle and the striving of my wife going through pregnancy and then labor. I can think of the process uh, for nine months, all these regulations, you know, and the diet and the do's and the don'ts. And, and then you get to the delivery and it's honestly just this crazy, scary, terrifying, messy, amazing, beautiful thing right? I remember my, my powerhouse wife going through all this pain and suffering, and then all of a sudden, the baby is born, and it's finished, right? The baby's here. It's like all of a sudden, this seismic change all of a sudden has happened. It's done. All the striving, all the work, all the pain, all the suffering, it's done, and this new life is here. No more striving needs to be done. So what do we do now, right? What do the parents do now? Like, here's the baby, what do you do? It's like, are you gonna go back to the pregnancy regimen, the diets, the restrictions? Are you gonna try to replicate the labor process because that was so fun, right? No, no, that, that would be pointless. The new life is here, the baby is here. There is no time to do that also because a child just takes so much time, but you have a new look on life. There's a new purpose and that is to go be a parent, right? As Christians, when Jesus, after all the suffering, after all the agony, all the pain on the cross, said, it is finished, 
Why would we keep doing all that work to earn our way to him? No, we, that would be madness. The new life is here. Let's walk in it. There's a new work to do. We want to be people who tell others that say, come experience this. Look what Jesus has done for you. Look what you don't have to do to earn your salvation. As we bring this to a close, I just think of the last few famous sentences of Jesus' earthly ministry before he ascended onto, uh, into heaven. These words give all Christians a new hope and a new purpose. The first ones being, it is finished. On the cross, before he sacrificed himself and gave up his life, Jesus said, it is finished. You don't have to do any more work. But it didn't end there, right? The next famous words, the Great Commission, what we've built our life on, what this church is all about, he then says, now go and do the work. There's a better work. Quit doing all the other work that doesn't matter. Go do my work. And then he ascended. Church, when sins get in the way, when we have sinned and we, we can remember that we have been forgiven, there's no work to be uh, done to earn God's favor you have been justified. You have been perfected by Jesus' work. God chooses to no longer remember your sin. And now he has given us a new and better work that Jesus has given us to bring more people to that knowledge, right? That's the new work that we have. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, Jesus, for who you are and what you've done for us. I thank you, Lord, that we don't have to walk in shame and guilt, Lord, that you have justified us, Lord, and you're sanctifying us. Even when we sin, when we fail, when we, when we uh, mess up, Lord, there's forgiveness, there's grace. You've already covered that with your blood, and I thank you for that, Lord. I pray you'd help us to lean in to that sanctif sanctification process, Lord, to trust you, to bring us along until you will complete the work you have for us, Lord. I thank, thank you, Lord, that you don't remember our sin anymore, would you help us to not remember our sin? Would you help us to not remember others' sin, to have the forgiveness that you have shown us? Would we be able to extend that to others, Lord? And would you help us as a church, Lord, to do the work that you have for us now? Not the work of earning your favor, but the work of going and telling others that they don't have to earn it, Lord. Would you help us in that? We love you. We thank you for your word and a chance to study it and to, to hear from you, Lord. We just ask that you would uh, be glorified in our worship now, and we pray all that in your name. Amen.